Okay, hopefully I'm not going to make you deaf by having it too loud. Uh, for me to get a better understanding, how many of you have even been to Mount Antero? Okay, so you guys in the back haven't been. Okay, that's a good start. Uh, happy to be here. I'm glad you're attending the first ever uh, Southern Colorado mineral show and they have the organizers of this have aspirations to make this a regional show and have it expand each year uh, which the mineral community outside of this area certainly supports so I'm happy to be here uh, what I'm going to do is give you a, a quick overview of the uh, the physical locality, the history of the locality, and some of the specimens that, depending on how hard you work, you might actually find. But you can certainly buy them. So that's that's a good thing. Uh, and a, I've, a lot of people through the, the decades have uh, helped provide me with pictures, photographs, and stories. So with that, I'll remember to find my slide advancer. There we go. Yep. Okay. So where is Mount Antero? Mount Antero is in the chain of 14,000 foot mountains that starts on the west side of the Arkansas Valley up at Leadville and goes straight down uh, following the Arkansas River. It's in Chaffee County. Let's see if I can get the... Good, that works. Okay. Uh, we now know that pointers do not work on electronic screens. Okay. Uh, Buena Vista and Salida are the only two real significant towns in the area. Uh, and of course Salida is the home of uh, the uh, Columbine Club. Uh, here's a list of all the minerals that could be found. A lot of them are rare, a lot of them are small. The ones with the stars are the important ones and the ones in the bold lettering are the ones that everybody wants to find. So, but the big, the big we'll say four specimens, is you can always find smoky quartz, you can always find at least signs of aquamarine, and aquamarine uh, alters with uh, hydrothermal solutions to phenakite, which is a white blocky mineral, and then alters again hydrates to uh, bertrandite. And the bertrandites and phenakites and aquamarines that are found here are the, are the either the best in the United States or among the best. Okay, here's a view looking to the east, and the way the mountain is accessed now is through those series of switchbacks that go up, up the mountain. Uh, it's a four-wheel drive road. The first switchback, let's see, can you even see the first switchback? Yeah, the first switchback is over there. <coughs> And it's called Dead Man's Curve. Uh, several vehicles have gone uh, over that edge on the downhill side, and, and actually, uh, there have there was uh, two families that essentially got wiped out coming down. So, if you're going to try to drive it, the advice I give you, and and pay attention to this one, going up is not a problem. Coming down, if you try to make the turn. As just a continuous turn, you got a 50% chance of going right off the edge. Okay, what you want to do is go a little bit on it. You want to go, instead of trying to turn, you go out into the flat area, back up, and then complete it as a two-point turn. You do it as a two-point turn, you could almost do it in your sleep. That is probably the most important thing I can tell you guys if you're going to go there. Okay, now we go to the fun stuff. Here's what it looks like. Uh, it's a paved road almost between the two mountains, and then it turns to a dirt road, graded dirt road. Once you get to that lake where you turn off, it turns into a true, a true blue Jeep trail. And the Jeep trail keeps changing each year because the ATVers go in there, and every time they, they race through there, they change the, the rocks and the debris, so, I, so the conditions keep changing. Anyway, uh, 
the locality is all above, all the locations are above 13,000 feet. If you are sensitive to elevation, do not be surprised that your oxygenation level drops below 90%. And if you're not physically fit, it's also a challenge. Anyway, there's a rope jeep trail continues on. One of the diggings is, popular diggings is here. There's diggings all through here. And then there's diggings back in this area. And there's some diggings even over here. And yes, people will tell you emphatically that every single thing on that mountain is claimed. That statement, of course, is not true. Uh, but if you're unwilling or unable to hike significant distances uh, and time away from the road, then you will be on somebody's claims. The, the places that the claims are open is away from the roads. Now, if you're just a hiker, you can hike anywhere you please. These are all claims. So if someone comes up and says, you can't go here, you just smile, laugh, and as long as they don't pull a gun on you, you just say, I'm hiking through. And if they're reasonable people, they'll say, fine, continue on. Okay. Now, environmental problems. First, I've got I to shock you all and let you know that this is not a place you go for the faint-hearted. Uh, in the summer, at any time in the summer, you can get dense fog where you can't see more than 10 feet. You can get lightning at any time. You can get rain. You can get hail. And you can get s snow. And of course, the snow from the winter before stays up there until you can dig it out in June. But even in the middle of the summer, it can still snow on you. So the air, daytime temperature does not reach 60. If it's sunny out, you can go in a flannel shirt. If the sun isn't out, you're going to be in the high 50s. And if it's snowing, of course, it's going to be even lower. And, and there's been some snowstorms up there during the day where the snow comes at you almost horizontal due to the wind. Anyway, uh, rock slides. If you're not prepared to help dig out the road, you might have an extended stay on the mountain. Uh, but if you like wildlife, okay, now there's wildlife all over the places. This is, by the way, this, I, I captured this one with a 55 millimeter camera. I'm this close. And he was squeaking at me like, who are you and what are you doing here? Anyway, and the marmots, the marmots are really, really cute and they're really, really friendly and they love the oil and salt on your undercarriage of your car. And if you park your car and you don't do certain things, they'll, and you're away from the day, they'll come by and they'll go, oh, look at that electric cable. Oh, it's all oily. And goodbye cable. <laughs> anyway, and the goats. There's an abundance of goats there and their kids. And if you leave, if you put out, like, a, like for like dogs, you put out a pitcher, of, you know, a little thing of water and a little thing of food, yeah, they'll come into your camp. Uh, and that mountain is named for one of the Ute Indian leaders. Uh, who, they who, of course, were, was native to Colorado and, like all the other youths, got shoved out of the state. Now, the, it, as a 14er, once the railroads came in in about 1872, tourism all through the place, the camping, hunting, fishing, and just sightseeing increased. And they built a, a trail up to Mount Antero for tourists, and they found smoky quartz. Uh, and smoky quartz at that time, if it was gem quality, was called smoky topaz or topaz. And it sold in Denver and Colorado Springs and in Pueblo for about a dollar and a half to two dollars a pound. Uh, fascinating grade. Anyway, the uh, Nelson Wanamaker was actually a gold prospector. He uh, came to Colorado probably 1861-62, so he's not a genuine 59er. And he uh, was grub stake to come up to Antero and put in three gold claims. And while he was up there, he noticed minerals. And he found he could make a lot more money selling aquamarine and other minerals than selling just smoky quartz. So he is considered the prime collector and only distributor of Mount Antero minerals up until 1893. He lived, by the way, he lived in, 18, he lived in 1931. But that was, those were his collecting years, and in honor of him, they named him named this Wanamaker Basin. And in 1888, he built a little, I think it's, yeah, there it is. He built 
uh, a summer place where he could stay for a couple of weeks. It's the classic camping place, which is the walls are, are rock, and the top of it is uh, canvas. Anyway, he's, he sold it, and he sold it a lot of he sold a lot, a lot of things to uh, uh, Richard C. Hills, who was a geologist, lead geologist for Colorado Coal, no Colorado Fuel and Coal Company, which is the the major shall we say, smelter of iron, mine iron and smelter of iron ore in Pueblo. And late in life, he was, I'm on the wrong side of the room, that's why it's ringing. I'm too close to the speaker. Okay. He uh, basically built a, a giant collection of, of purchased materials, and he sold it to the Denver Museum. So his entire collection is still at the Denver Museum, acquired in 1912. Those, by the way, are big Bertrandite crystals, even from today's standards. So the stuff found now is as good as that. And he found aquamarines, the aquamarine, well, actually he bought, bought aquamarines. Richard Hills never went there. Anyway, he bought it, and because he was an honorary curator at the Denver Museum, he also described it, and there's what he published, and there's the crystal, the actual crystal that it was described from. Uh, he made friends, Wanamaker that is, Wanamaker made friends with an assistant geologist at the USGS named Walter Brown Smith, who was a, a, a mineral dealer part-time at, at the same, and he, Brown bought, collected with Wanamaker and bought some specimens, and which were then, some of them were turned over to the USGS, which ended up in the, in the Smithsonian, which, which is where that one is. And that's neat because it's an aquamarine crystal, jemmy, with a phenakite, the white phenakite on the top. Now, big blobs of quartz were also found, clear and smoky. Two giant ones made it to the uh, Columbian Exhibition in 1893. One's faceted, one's polished. They're on loan to the Carl School of Mines right now, so you can see them on exhibit. Wanamaker left Colorado in about 1901. 1901 well, actually, he left, sorry, he left in 1918 after his wife passed away because he was a homesteader late in life near Durango. And the next person who started making trips there was Ed Over when he was a young guy. And he first went up there in 28. Those are his collecting years, not his lifetime. And there were, he did it as a business, and there weren't many buyers in those days. Basically, he had Harvard and he had the Smithsonian. They take turns buying the best. So here you have from his 1932 trip with some of the largest ones. And these are, some of them are in Harvard today, and some of them are in the Smithsonian. There's the largest one that is at Harvard. He collected two seven-inch ones, not facet grade, and was on exhibited uh, at the Tucson Gemma Mineral Show in 08. There's a matrix piece that he had found that what used to be on exhibit in the Smithsonian. It's also been illustrated in a couple of books. And then if you have a whole handful of, of just basically jemmy crystals. This is typical of what is being collected today. So most stuff that you can go, if you work really hard and you're lucky, you, you can find single crystals. If you're looking for a matrix piece, that's extremely rare. So there's a matrix piece that's been on exhibit, uh, both Smithsonian material, been on exhibit. The Smithsonian has showed up once or twice being exhibited at the Denver show, uh, and it's also illustrated in other books. The phenakites usually don't get as illustrated because they're not as photogenic. They're, now, these are big. These are these, anything over half an inch is big, and anything over an inch is gigantic. So if you have a two-inch phenakite, from Antero or anywhere in Colorado, you're going to get people's attention quick. Okay, Ed Over and Art Montgomery were partners. Art Montgomery was independently wealthy, a Harvard graduate, and he also was a mineral dealer for a while. And he teamed up with Ed Over to do collecting all through the U.S. And if you if you know the mineral collecting literature, they were quite famous all over the place. So they went there for I think three weeks in the summer of 38, and they were asked to take along an, a graduate student named George Switzer, a kid straight out of the East Coast, got on a train, drove to Salida, got picked up 
in Salida. So here it is, straight from sea level, and they drag them up, up here. And this camp is at about uh, 10, 8 to 11,000 feet. And that these are photos that were taken from his camera, but by his, by his partners. Now, George Switzer did not dig that pit. He just went into the pit and posed. And, but it over moved on to other locations after 1951, and he was known for a whole bunch of other discoveries. And there's a large amount of literature talking about his other places and specimens he sold. Now, Richard Pearl, who was a uh, professor at Colorado College, said, you know, we ought to make this into a, a permanent lo mineral locality for people to collect. And he tried to convince the federal government to make it a park where you could collect but not claim. Unsuccessful. But he did convince the Forest Service to allow him to build or to put in a plaque on Colorado Day. Now, there was no road back then, so these guys had a hike from about 8,000 feet to a base camp at about 11, and then hike the following day. There were 10 people who made the trip, and Jim Hurlbut, who was president of the Colorado Mineral Society, that's what CMS stands for, uh, read the proclamation and helped put and glue the, the plaque in. And that plaque was actually there up until about 90, no, up until about 88, and someone stole it. If it surfaces, and it will eventually surface after the person who stole it dies and the people left don't realize. But it will surface. Anyway, in 1956, the federal government said, we do not have enough reserves of beryllium ore. And they put a price support in saying anybody who mines beryl, and it contains 6% beryllium oxide, We'll buy it at a, at a depot in South Dakota, and it set and, and other depots, and it set off a gold a beryl mining boom across the entire United States. Now, when you have a mining boom, you have people who want to make their profit from the mine, and you have people who want to make their profit from the investors. And I will leave it to you to decide which kind of activity this was. Uh, Grady got out of the military, so this is a great opportunity. He put in the yellow claims that you see there. He uh, leased a bulldozer and started building the road up the, up the mountain that we use today, which is this one. Uh, he kept the claims, this was again in the 50s, but he kept the claims to about 58, sold it to another company called Vanguard Chemical. Vanguard Chemical didn't pay its bills and went belly up in about 1962-63. The claims you see on the other side, oh, and there's the excavations that were made on the south knob of Antero. Most of this is all during the 50s and 60s, using bulldozers and so on. CYAC stands for Cardwell Young Armstrong Cardwell. That was the consortium, and except for the Cardwells, they were out of Kansas. And all those investors those guys, because they were the original investors, they all lost their money. Uh, and that was the end of those activities. Now, the ones on White Mountain were staked by John King. John King, of course, was a native of Colorado near Salida. He played, played the uh, violin and also participated in the summer violin concerts given through Colorado. Uh, he staked all those claims, and, and when the Vanguard Chemical offered to buy him out, he said, fine. Uh, and that's John, John King in 88, uh, and he sold some of his stuff to other dealers, and they in turn then gave, sold them to the Denver Museum. Uh, Gunnell was a prominent mineral dealer in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So there's, what, there's the diggings that were done by that group. Most of those strips you see there were just bulldozer cuts. I don't think there was ever anything in those cuts, but there are minerals to be found nearby. The California mine, which was uh, staked for molybdenum during a 1912 molybdenum boom, which was very short-lived, uh, 
the guys who staked that mine had three claims. They got them patented. No sooner was it patented than, of course, the molybdenum boom died, and they didn't pay their taxes, and the county took the land over. Now, it's a long story as to what happened to the ownership, but basically, Andy Taylor was a graduate student in Colorado School of Mines. Jim Tarnack and the other two guys, the, the four of them, said, let's, let's go collect aquamarines. So they went up there, and there's a long story behind it, but they got up there and they decided they were going to mine underground. Illegally, of course. So they went in and they bought their dynamite in the hardware store in uh, Golden. Uh, Victor was the blaster. And they, what they do is they go in, they drill some hand holes, load the dynamite, blow it off while they were outside, let it sit for a day, and then they go in and they shovel all the debris onto a pickup truck and wash it in the creek. And they found bed sheets of stuff. This was the biggest one that he found, which has passed through many hands and has ended up in Dave Bunk. That's uh, Andy Taylor in, that was, by the way, that's the years of the mining. That's not, Andy <laughs> lived a lot longer than that. Because this picture is from, I think, uh, 1995. Uh, George Fisher was just a collector, a very, very vigorous collector in many different places. And he found an absolute fabulous uh, phenakite on Matrix which a lot of people wanted, but it has, it has disappeared. His collection was sold to Brian Lees, did not have this when Brian Lees bought it. I don't think it's lost. I think someone has it and they just haven't displayed it. Oh, legally owns it. Okay, Steve Brighton, uh, who actually still lives in the uh, Denver metro area, uh, went on the ground and came out with a cluster of uh, very faint aquamarine. That, that picture's a little bit washed out. Uh, he also found the big phenakite. If you notice, that one is three centimeters. That's over an inch and a quarter. That is gigantic. And that was the end of another little flurry of that mining. But now people are starting to, starting to get a lot more mineral collectors. And you have these two guys, only one illustrated. It's Curtis and Cliff. People refer to them as the hippies because they lived up there for the whole summer. They mined, they were incredibly successful, and they sold everything they found for food and just hanging out there. Uh, they bunk traded for that large one, which is about this big. Uh, he gave them an old, beat up station wagon. The Keyhole Bug area, that's the important part. is these cliffs here. Anybody who collects in the keyhole bugs area does risk their life unless they're young and they're quite strong and sharp. Nobody's going to bother you there. Some of them are under, some of that area is under claim or some of it's not. But if, even if it's under claim, no one's going to bother you. <laughs> because they get, you'll see them coming for a couple of miles away. Okay. It has produced some of the most spectacular phenakites you can imagine. These are drill bit twins, which are super rare. Two and a half, 2.7 centimeters, that's more than an inch. So they're, and they're gem quality, and they're yellow. You, uh, these, I can assure you, if, if these were offered for sale, and they're not, <laughs> you're probably looking between two to 5,000 a piece. And here's one on a matrix, which is even more breathtaking because it's completely gem quality amber. And amber phenakites are the, the sort of the, the champagne because if you leave an amber phenakite out in the sun, it becomes clear. This one uh, was found up on Mount Wyke hiking back at the end of the day. Jim Pashis, who's referred to this specimen because he wrote up the discovery, he was and he was collecting with Andy Taylor. He described this as he was paid two keys of a grand piano. So he got several thousand dollars for it. The telephone booth pocket was found by Greg and John. The pocket was so big that Larry Piekenbrock was just hiking by and they said, could you come and help us? <laughs> and he said, yes. There, You can see the Smokies piled over there. So it was just Smokies on top of Smokies. On, and it's called a telephone booth because you, you could fit it was a telephone phone booth size, and there's a pocket 
that actually was even bigger than that, found decades later. But anyway, the bad news or sad news is that it had loads of aquamarines in it, but they all look like this. Not a single facetable piece. Larry, of course, was a collector on his own, so there's one of his longer elongated clear phenakites, and he also found uh, unedged topaz. Now, back in those days, there were only two, three topaz discoveries known. They were brown, corroded, ugly, unfacetable. So any topaz, even today, is still very rare. Uh, John Munchen looked at through the micromounts and found bazite. Now, bazite has the same crystal structure as beryl, but it has scantium and it's a light blue color and extremely rare and this is actually, a reason, even though it's only one millimeter in size, it's still uh, highly desirable as a rare mineral. Marge Regal, who's still around, still collecting, single collector on her own. Is she here? No, she, she's, not, she's not in the room. She's, oh. no, she didn't come down. No. Yeah. I haven't seen her. Well, when, when, I, when I gave this talk yeah. in Canyon City in March, she was there. She was Thursday at the CSMS club meeting. I'm sorry? She was Thursday at the CSMS club meeting. Good. She covers a lot of territory and has found a lot of remarkable things. These were her early day helvites. Helvite is a berlinium uh, octahedral mineral, silicate. Very rare, highly desirable, and these are relatively big. She also found fabulous aquas. The one on the right is in the Denver Museum that she donated it to them. She still has the one on the left. Now, one of the mythologies that evolved in time back in the 80s was people would tell you, oh, if you find fluoride in your pocket, you're not going to find any aquas. They're all going to be etched and gone. And for chemical reasons, that's just completely bogus. And this is... I'm sorry? Proof. <laughs> yes. Uh, as you can see, these are pretty sharp. And uh, just uh, last week, I photographed some very nice euhedral uh, burls in fluorite. And of course, you saw an earlier picture of a pristine aquamarine poked out of a fluorite. Uh, Marge gave me this one, which I'm thrilled to have because she found it, and also because it's a, it's a fabulous specimen, about that big, just coated with little phenikites on the two faces. Uh, George Robinson was another hardcore antero person, and he, he was out there when, yeah, I think it was Gary, yeah, Gary Pollock hit a big pocket that he had to walk to a fluorites and it was too big for him to do, and he invited Keith O'Donnell, who lived in uh, BB at that time, and George Robinson, who lived near Westcliff. Uh, he lived in the Wet Mountains, so to come help. And it was a big pocket. Uh, it was, I mean, it was just beer flat after beer flat. These things were at, made it to the market in 82, 83, disappeared. They're very distinctive. They're light green, they're on albite, and they're not, they're, they're kind of a, like a bubbly face. There's one, there's another. And we're now sort of into the generation of, of people who, lots of people just like specialized collecting just on Antero. And these are both Antero collectors. Bill was only Antero. Tim collected in other places. This Tim Hilston collected. And Bill had his own claims, and some of his stuff, which you'll see in a minute, were absolutely award-winning. Tim found a great phenakite poked out of a uh, fluorite, and he got the Prospector's Trophy in 2002 for it. Uh, Bill's claims, which were two claims, one of which was called My Star's Pit, and here we have him sitting, standing in his pit, so there's Bill, there's Tim Hilston, and there's another Antero collector that's uh, Jeff Self. And I have these two guys' names, but I just forgot them. <laughs> this is what Bill found. That's almost an inch wide as a cluster, and it got the Prospector's Trophy. Now, Prospector's Trophy is awarded each year 
at the Denver show for a mineral that was found the previous year and in anywhere has to be self-collected and it has a, only that one year window to win the award so it's the best that anyone found and is willing to exhibit for that year. John Tyndale who is not a a uh, serious Antero collector, but he did go there several times, went up into the keyhole bug area and hit uh, a narrow pocket. You can see the pocket that he's next to and you can see what the view looks like from the digging area. So again, if you feel nervous on slopes that are greater than 60 degrees, then yeah, you don't want to go there. Anyway, he exhibited in competition for the Prospector Award two yellow phenakites on matrix and drill bit twinned. And that phenakite is three centimeters long. So these, these were so spectacular, he got good money for them when he sold them to two different people, but Dave Bunk, who specializes in the best of Colorado, went to special efforts to make sure he bought both of them. So that's great. Now the sad news is they're yellow, they're amber. You're never gonna see these exhibited in a show or in a case. Bill Hutchinson has been an Antero fanatic. He lives uh, in north of the Denver Center and he's found lots of different things. Here's his, his prospector's award for a terminated aqua. And he has whole bunches of other ones besides the terminated one. And he's got piles of phenakites, he's got drill bit twins, he's got smoky quartz crystals. So he has quite a collection of very attractive things. Now, I mentioned that all the claims were, you know, basically abandoned in 62. Tommy, which was Grady's son, felt that it was inappropriate to let the claims lapse completely. So he went back out there and he claimed what are now called Blue Star 1 through 14. And there's two more claims up right off the edge of this that he also has claimed. So the Cardwell, when people talk to the Cardwell claims now, they're talking about that block of 1 through 14. And I'll be talking more about it, but it was Tommy, the son, who reactivated it, and their intent when they restaked it in 69 was they referred to it as the largest Berlinium deposit in the free world. An excessively gross, uh, more, it's more than an exaggeration. In 1967, uh, Brush Berlinium purchased a bunch of claims in Utah uh, near Spore Mountain. Spore Mountain is a volcanic deposit that spewed out basically tooths and lavas, mostly tooths. The tooths, meaning, and tooth is not as dense as, it's lightish colored and softer than a lava. And it contains bertrandite crystals up to about one and a half percent. They started mining it in 67 and the bottom dropped out of the market for burl. No, we don't open that door. We can open this one. Still on time. Uh, basically, with the cratering of the uh, market for berlinium, if it wasn't, at, Spore Mountain provided at that time about 90% of all the uh, uh, berlinium ore we needed in, in the world. So, if you tried to mine beryl in anything else, there was no hope of making a profit. The so called reputed assays from this area gave percentages of burl that just did not exist. So there really never was any hope of mining the Antero granite for berlinium metal. Uh, and, and that holds true today. So now we're back looking at the same area that's now under claim. And what happened was, is Bill Hutchinson went to the Tommy, which is on the right, and said, you know, you're never going to make any money, even, you know, at all, on ore. 
why don't you just mine gemstones? So they liked that idea. They closed off their claims to collectors, and they started digging for their on their own, and there's some of the stuff they found. That's Craig. Uh, Tommy passed away about five years ago. And what, what Tommy and Craig did is they would sublet it to other people for mining. So they sublet it to uh, Brian Lees, who was hoping for a giant pocket, which he never found, so he had it for one summer and then gave it up. Now, by 08, 09, Craig Cardwell realized that letting people come and collect as tourists could make reasonable money. And then he also allowed any prospector who wanted to dig on their own, to dig on their own and share 50% of what they find. So if you want to go up there and dig to your heart's content uh, and are signed an agreement to share 50% of what you find, then yeah, you're welcome there. Uh, Jeff Self, of course, had to find his own digging area since when the Cardwells switched to gems, all the collectors who, who for decades collected on that, in that area were told, leave, go find a new place. So Jeff Self did find a new place. There he's sitting in a pot, one of the pockets he found. He found big fluorites, matrix pieces with muscovite and albite and microcline. Uh, he found lots and lots of phenakites and, of course, large smoky quartzes and, of course, aquamarines. But he's a, a, a dealer, so that most of the gem stuff in the micas and the smoky quartz has been sold. But if you still want stuff, if you contact him directly, I'm sure you could talk him into selling things. He also found Bertrandite pockets. This is about a third of the size of the big one that... that uh, Bill Chernside found, but it's still very similar in style. Walter Roth lives in Alpine. He's a, a quiet man, secretive, uh, does not like to be bothered, and he would collect for himself on Mount Antero. And he'd been doing, he's been doing it since the 80s. And he found a pegmatite outside the Cardwell claims, unclaimed ground, and he hit a big pocket there. There's some of the Smokies. There's some of his close-ups. Those are the ones he still keeps. Here's what they look like laid out on the table. That pegmatite, not that pocket, but that pegmatite was taken over by uh, Steve Brancato, and he opened up an aquamarine pocket in that, in, in that land. He then opened up a Sherry Topaz one, an uh, icicle pocket because the aquas were etched, he hit, a one, he hit one, two, three more pockets. The subway pocket, which was his last one, it was called a subway because it had an entrance into what, like going underground, a subway. The opening was twice this size. He dug it down about 30 feet. There's pictures of people standing at the bottom of the pit. It, piles and piles of smoky quartz came out of that one. Clear quartz came out of that one. No aquas. No phenakites, no bertrandite. No. He's basically abandoned. If you walk up to look at it now, of course, you can see the water filling it up to the rim. And he's got matrix pieces of clear quartz and, and uh, microcline and albite just laying all over the place because there's no money dragging them out. Now, if you just like mineral specimens, you can go there and get some very nice clusters of clear quartz with albite. Anyway, there's Steve in 06. Now, the Diane's pocket, which is next, he was hit, he hit a large pocket. This was his biggest one of aquas, uh, all loose, and he went and talked to Brian. And Brian says, bring everything down, and we'll reconstruct. So he went back up there, and he brought down everything that was related to that pocket. And Brian bought everything. And then Brian had the task of trying to put it back together. Now the ones that did the pieces that did not fit together are what he used to create this slab, which is about this big. Okay, so this is not an actual specimen. 
It is a creation from pocket pieces of all things I should know better. <laughs> My apologies to you all. Uh, but nevertheless, as they say, it is still spectacular. There's still people who crowd around it and ogle it, and hopefully they don't drool on the case. Now, matrix pieces were found and reconstructed. This is one of three publicly known specimens. There's reputed to have been five matrix pieces that were reconstructed. Three have been exhibited, and only two keep on re-showing. This, one, this one's my favorite. Uh, that single big aqua is gigantic, and these, the ones that were reconstructed, being repaired uh, from Brancato's pocket, are the best matrix pieces that I know of from Mount Antero. Brancato also hit a pocket of gem quality sherry's topazes. Uh, of course, the best one went to either Dave Bunk or Brian Lee's, depending on who you want to believe. <laughs> They're both. Uh, absolutely spectacular. There's another individual who has four other ones, uh, and I have not been given the liberty to say who. Uh, California mine, patented land, abandoned, high graded for decades and decades. Finally, with all the attention it was getting, uh, the guy who owned it wanted to get rid of it. A consortium made up of Lowell Hicks, who is a North Fork, uh, near the San Juan Mountains, miner who knows how to mine, knows how to weld. He owns most of the shares. Mark Kravanek is a jeweler who facets Antero stuff for sale, very successful. And Juan Doyle is a graduate student at the University of Tulsa who comes and helps. So they, they uh, dug out the collapsed attic, put a gate in, lock gate, portal, uh, rails, and set it up so that you cannot drive a pickup truck even near this. So no, you cannot get close enough to this to put a wire, to put a chain over it and yank the door open. There they are, mucking it out. Uh, the, and it's act, except for one partially collapsed area, it's actually still in great, great condition. They're mucking it out by hand on the old rails, and then they sort the material and they pull the broken pieces of aqua that's in it. The pegmatite is just extremely prolific with little bugs, with aquamarine, and the middle of the night tends to be along the, the contacts with the country rock. Uh, this is just one in this area, because this whole area has just piles and piles of little burl veins. They're not pegmatites, they're literally called grisons or burl veins. Now, uh, Mark Kravanek, his claim is called Chippendale, and there he uses a uh, a machine, and the purpose of the machine is not to dig the granite, but to move the rock, because the peg, the aquas he's finding are loose aquas found in the dirt. So he reveals the ground, lets the permafrost melt, and then the stuff rolls out, and he just collects it. Uh, he did. He does about 12 days each year. This is part of his. This is the facetable facetable gem rough from 2020. These are his three biggest terminated ones, which are not going to be cut. There's the scale bar, so you're looking at greater than, the biggest one is better than two and a half inches. And then we get to Craig Cardwell, which I had mentioned was the sun. He operates year-round. He's moved from Texas to uh, Colorado. He has a home in, along the bowl, and, well, up the valley towards Mount Antero, and he has a gem shop in BV, uh, and the, this is the current crew that he had. So we have Craig, Tracy, his wife. That's his no, yeah, that's his. That's his daughter. That's the uh, operator for the machine. Uh, that's Justin Ivory. Uh, I have names for these guys. I just didn't put them on the photograph. All working for shares, and. I could do a talk just on what Cardwell's friends have found. Aquas, phenakites, helvites, uh, topazes, 
Aqua, so there's a hell bite. That one is twice to three times the size of Marge's biggest. Uh, there's Justin Ivory's. This is just one of his pocket of topazes. Uh, again, you, you like the Phoenixites. Sherry topaz you don't leave out in the light, it will fade away. And there's another gem, amber phenakite, 1.2 centimeters, so it's, 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 reason, it's a respectable size. And the, just last, yeah, last, last summer, Jason's on the left, Ian's on the right, they're a digging pair. They hit uh, another sherry topaz pocket, that's what the pocket looks like. And this, by the way, is just half of the crystals because it gets split in half. Craig gets half and they get the other half. Now, if you want to buy their stuff, they're, they're usually in Sanders' Royal Crown Plaza show. They're also selling, they also sell in Tucson and they also sell at various other places. So, and their stuff is mined by them. There's the largest topaz. That thing sits in a hand in their hand like that. Uh, this is the aquas they found, their share, and that brings us up to the present day. So it's a still an active locality. There's many new collectors working both inside and outside the claim block. There's a tremendous number of inexperienced and unprepared collectors who do not belong up there for their own life. And the only thing that will guarantee success is hard work and luck. Luck by itself, because of all the claims, you've got to get around them, means you're going to have to at least walk and deal with the altitude. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. that was in one of your pictures. They have a, a little film on the YouTube about the discovery of that topaz pocket. That was found, if, if the pocket, if the discovery of it shows what Ian and Jason found, then it's, it's accurate. Yeah, I it, remember that big one. Yes. And he has it in his hand like this in the film. Yes, I have a picture of when he took it out in his hand.